So, um, you know, I made some changes to what I had earlier intended uh, as part of the presentation for trial readiness to more about talking what goes on and what we need to think of when we look at our children um, with <coughs> children most of dystrophy. So, you know, when we think about our breathing system, it's actually a simple but very complex structure. It is a set of ribs, 12 pairs on each, 12 pairs, 12 on each side, that articulate or join with a bunch of vertebral bodies in the back, and that's what presents to us a very dynamic, mobile, and flexible um, structure called the rib cage. And it is important to understand that this, that every breath that you take here and don't even wrinkle your shirt is largely due to the fact that you have a three-dimensional change in chest wall architecture with every breath. So when you have a front, the, um, actually, do it right now. Put your hand on your chest and take a nice deep breath. So see, I can see all your hands coming up and towards this corner of the room. So this upward movement is what actually increases the front to back measurements of the chest. What happened while your ribs lifted is it increased the left to right dimensions of the chest. And the part that you didn't see was your diaphragm moving down. And that increases the vertical dimension of the chest. So it's a three-dimensional distortion. And the reason I keep saying that is because it's really important to understand that whenever there is chest wall tightness, you're likely to use, use two out of three of these very quickly and often at the same time. So what we do when we go from an upright position to a recumbent position is important to understand. When you're upright, gravity helps you by keeping the bowel contents off the diaphragm. And so taking a breath becomes really easy and expanding the chest wall. But what happens when, the, when you lay down is that gravity still acts in a downward manner and now you have the abdominal contents pushing the diaphragm to a much higher resting position and as a result, we land up with a much lower lung volume. So, the normal change in lung capacity when going from an upright to a recumbent position is anywhere from 5 to 20% depending on your body structure. Anything over 25% is construed to be associated with diaphragmatic weakness. And now this is largely adult data. My sense is that these numbers are probably a little lower when it comes to children. So how important is breathing deeply enough? Right? So if you were to take a normal breath of 500 ml sitting over here, it is important to remember that not all of that 500 ml of air is going to go and help you with gas exchange. Some of it is going to just fill up the conducting airways and the rest will go to the lung which is responsible where the actual exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide takes place. So what happens, we call that space dead space. That means it's not participating in gas exchange. What happens when you start breathing shallower is the conducting airways or the dead space still takes its pound of flesh. So you land up actually having to subtract that dead space from whatever normal breath you take. So although you went from 500 mils to maybe 250 mils as a single breath, after you subtract the 150 for dead space, even though your tidal volume dropped 50%, the actual amount of air available for gas exchange dropped over 70%. So this is a really important part to understand that breathing shallow is really a cause for concern, and that breathing faster isn't necessarily going to change or improve things. So what we see clinically is the cycle of muscle weakness, often leading to chest wall rigidity, and I'll explain that in a moment. There is diaphragm dysfunction. The subsequently, the cough gets affected and impaired, and that further leads to breathing a little faster and shallower and also adds clinical fatigue. So, what do I mean when I say chest wall rigidity? Children who run, jump, and play develop chest walls 
that are normal, they move well with normal breaths, and that's largely because the chest walls, with their physical activity, move through a wide range of excursion. You run up a flight of steps, <coughs> and you are able to do that because your chest wall is not tight. You reach the top end of the flight of steps, and you take these big, deep breaths. Now, if that chest wall gets really tight, it gets very difficult to do that. What do I mean by diaphragm dysfunction? Sometimes there is scoliosis, and what happens with scoliosis is you actually have rotation of the vertebral bodies. And I actually just added some images to show you what I mean by that in a little bit. And with that comes turning of the ribs. Now the diaphragm gets inserted to the lower ribs, so what happens is it's like you take a sheet of paper and then you twist it. And that's exactly how the diaphragm begins to get torqued or twisted and its effectiveness is reduced. And that leads to reduction in the ability to take a deep breath, which is important for a cough. And so you can see how that perpetuates a cycle of discomfort and perhaps difficulty in recovery from an illness should it ever get into the chest cavity. So how do we assess our patients? And then broadly, you know, we can look at testing of the children awake as well as asleep. You know, the sleep, um, the awake portion you may have heard, these include pulmonary function tests, and some of them are non-invasive, and this includes sitting in a box, doing some breathing maneuvers, and some of them are a little more invasive, and I'll show you some to that effect. And then the ones that the, I would like for you to think of the sleep study as a form of pulmonary function tests performed when the child is asleep, because it's giving you information that the awake testing is not providing you. And that is, what is the gas exchange, the oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange in the body? And is there sleep disruption that occurs as a consequence of not breathing properly? In fact, one of the most common complaints that we get is insomnia. So every time the body's breathing starts getting inefficient, the body says, hey, wake up, take a deep breath. And so people wake up frequently through the night and very often they'll say, I wake up, I don't know why I woke up, and I went back to sleep. But it happens frequently enough that they feel a little tired when they wake up in the morning. Overnight oximetry is an option, but it is still limited. It only tells you about the oxygen level in sleep, but it tells you nothing about carbon dioxide, and it doesn't tell you anything about what we call the sleep architecture, or the continuity of sleep through the night. The child is growing and needs good sleep, and it's not just the quantity, it's also the quality of the sleep that is important to us. We want for these children to go to school and be successful. So um, I'll show you a few examples to give you an idea of what some of these parameters mean. So this is what a typical pulmonary function includes, where um, you sit in a box or on a comfortable chair and you breathe in and out of a machine that records a bunch of data. And some of this breathing is done at rest. So this is what your normal t tidal volume is, that's what TV is, not television. <laughs> Good, you're awake. So, tidal volume is what you breathe on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, and this is what happens if you breathe out all the way until you can't breathe out anymore. <coughs> then we say take a deep breath in all the way until you can't breathe in anymore, and then you breathe out normally. So, this whole range that went from here to here is what you can normally do. It's like if you squeeze everything out of your lung and you took a big, huge breath that you could not take anymore. That is what we call the vital capacity. So, what's left in the lung after a normal breath is this combination here. This amount of air, the residue volume, once that child has taken this first breath, you can never get it out. <coughs> so, this combination of these two chambers is called the functional residual capacity. So when we see limitations, we typically start seeing the floor and the ceiling begin to come together. So it's almost like saying we are on, let's say, the third floor. It's the second floor, the floor of the second floor that starts coming up, and it's the ceiling of the fourth floor that starts coming down. Right? So imagine if you're here at floor number two, this, sorry, the third floor, this is the second floor and this is the fourth floor. 
So you have the floor coming up and the ceiling coming down. But eventually, this often happens because children are not physically very active. If I were to cast your arm and give you a little laxity in the cast and only give you this much mobility, and I took the cast off six weeks later, you would only have this much mobility, right? Because you developed a contracture. So individuals who don't move the chest to the full range of motion are only going to be left with little mobility. So what happens when contractures pro progress is that you begin to experience eventual reductions even in tidal breathing. And that's the point at which they start breathing shallower and faster at baseline. So, you know, when we look at the pulmonary function test for the, on the spirometer, we look at this fancy thing called a flow volume loop. And this is what a normal loop should look like, where, ironically, inspiration is down, breathing in, and this is the where you breathe out. So this is say you breathe out forced, hard <coughs> and deep, you keep breathing, keep breathing, keep breathing, and then you finally can't squeeze anything out of your lung, and you take a deep breath in. So this is called a flow volume loop. This is measuring flow. And what it looks like in, in muscle weakness is that the curve is certainly smaller, it's shorter, they reach a shallower peak, it's not as high, and also their breathing in is not as quick. And the thing that, there's a little detail that we see is that as they're breathing out, they suddenly fall off very quickly. So it's like I say, if you have to have a child blow out candles, where you would have a nice long deep breath and blow out for a longer period of time, forcefully, theirs is going to be a shallow, shallower and a shorter exhalation. Okay? And so it's important that whoever is conducting the test understands the diagnosis because it is unrealistic to expect children to breathe out for a full six seconds, like you and I would for this test, and that three seconds or four seconds may have to be adequate and be accepted. So this is a patient of ours with um, um, Mersin deficient uh, physio muscle dystrophy. And what I want to show, I hope it's clear, <coughs> Can you, you know, speak a little bit louder? Sure. Better? Oh, you want me to start from the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, he had, I'm sorry. He's got a vital capacity. This is the spirometry that tells you the forced vital capacity. And that's at about 25%. But when I look at his respiratory muscle strength, he's at about 55 to 65%. So this is important, right? That the degree of contractures sometimes is so much more than the degree of weakness that we see. Which goes back to that discussion we had yesterday amongst ourselves, why I think I'm a little worried about using force vital capacity as a true marker of outcome, because I think this is affected earlier before you even see changes in respiratory muscle strength. And it bothers me that I think some of this may be independent of respiratory muscles per se. So, um, and the other thing that's important is, now he's of course a little older, he's 15, and his carbon dioxide level while awake was 51, and we normally like it under 40 to 45. But not only is it 51, but he's breathing about 23 times a minute, which is a little fast for a 16 year old who's just sitting in a wheelchair. If you're sitting here in a chair, and you breathe 23 times a minute, you will likely pass out, because you will hyperventilate. So this speaks to how tight the chest is and the fact that they cannot expand it. It takes too much energy to expand fully and um, why we need to implement certain stretching maneuvers for the chest. So coming to invasive testing, um, this is not done universally, but I strongly consider this to be an alt a better alternative for um, drug trials. And what it is is a pressure transducer that's introduced to the nostril, and as soon as you feel it at the back of the throat, you start swallowing, and just like anything else. And then, you know, you see the tracing of the food pipe, the signal in the food pipe, which is the esophagus, and then in the stomach. So when both these sensors are in the chest cavity, you see how these, sen these two signals are opposite to each other? If they are both in the chest cavity, they both would be in sync. What you're seeing here is that the chest develops a negative pressure, which is how we normally breathe. And when the diaphragm moves down, it produces a negative pressure in the chest. 
that's what sucks air in. The chest is like a syringe. You pull the plunger down, that's what draws in, air in. But in the abdomen, you get a positive pressure. And that's how you know that the sensors are in the correct position. And then you can measure the patient's cough pressures. You can measure crying pressures in infants and children. You can measure um, a deep inspiratory pressure. You can measure a forced expiratory pressure. You can measure occlusion pressures. There are a variety of things you could do and that are fairly well, um, re fairly reproducible um, in these individuals because you don't lose any of that um, energy in distorting chest wall structure, lung tissue, overcoming upper airway resistance, all of these things. Oh, this is me, where I actually had this done on myself in order to understand the test better. I have a habit of trying all of the equipment and all of my, so that I can explain it better. And what you see over here is the chest, negative pressures in the chest with normal breathing. And this very high spike was almost 80 centimeters of water pressure. It was actually just what we call a peristalsis. That was my food pipe trying to move a foreign body out of its system. And um, later on, I actually, well, I took off those slides, but I actually was able to do sniff pressures and pretty consistent readings regardless. Um, so then I want to take you, walk you through some early changes that we see in chest x-rays. And so, between children with congenital myopathies, muscular dystrophies, I think it's important to think about architecture. With good form comes good function. So if people are not structured properly, no matter what therapy you give eventually, it gets really hard to recover function if you aren't formed properly. So I'm, we particularly are very careful and very focused on having a good shape and <coughs> functional shape of the chest wall. So what you see is a, you know, a child with um, a congenital myopathy at two years, three years, and five years of age, and although it may not look very obvious to you, the thing that occurs at around this time is you see the ribs make almost a 90 degree, um, have a 90 degree orientation to the vertical axis of the spine, and they start slanting down and become much more. Whenever I see something like this, that to me is a neuropathic chest. And we see this in SMA, we see this in spinal cord injuries, we see in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. When they finally get involved, we see this in congenital muscular dystrophies too. And when I look at them sideways, we tend to see much more collapse of the front to back measurements of the chest wall because the sternum is being brought down, the breastbone is being brought down, and that actually leads to much more reduced lung volumes. Right? This is again progression over time. And uh, this is asterisk for me is an indication of when the person came on, started using um, non-invasive ventilation. And this is what I say, it's not that the ribs are turning only, it's the actual vertebral body that's rotating and it's taking the ribs with it. And as a result, you find that one portion on the back gets more prominent than the other side. And that's because of the entire rib cage just turning. So, um, this is what I wanted to show you as in the drop in the angle of the ribs over time. And more importantly, um, there is this reduction. I don't know if you can see it clearly because of the windows, but um, there's this retrosternal collapse, is what we call it, of instead of having this nice, curved, healthy shaped chest, it's a very straight, <coughs> non mobile um, appearance. I'll skip through that. This again is, you know, two boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy just to illustrate the point that it was just a, the respiratory muscle strength went from 100% in one patient and this is a younger patient with 75% muscle strength. And just based on this x-ray, even in the absence of clear symptomatology, we went ahead and got a sleep study and this individual had a high carbon dioxide level just based on the x-ray. We're now able to, I think, fairly cleanly predict who likely should be triaged for a sleep study or not. So I wanted to share this with you um, about the rotation that I mentioned with the diaphragm. So this actually is a muscular dystrophy with myositis mouse model. And you know, at two weeks, you really don't see much of a difference between the, um, affected, the, the affected one and the wild type. 
which is the unaffected one. But at six weeks, there were very dramatic differences in both the size of the animal and the mobility of the animal, and also what happened to the chest and spine. Now, remember, this is an animal model that is horizontal. They're not upright with us with, for gravity. So it was interesting for me to understand that even horizontally opposed animals can still develop scoliotic deformities. So what they did was they actually did um, special CT scans with reconstructions. And I want to draw your attention to um, this at two weeks of age. If you look at the diaphragm footprint, it looks pretty clean and all very similar between both the animal models. But look and see what happens at six weeks in the animal model. So, you know, when you look at this structure, you think about it, which side of the chest wall is really going to produce enough of diaphragmatic <coughs> mobility? It's going to be only one side. Now, air takes the path of least resistance. And so, it starts inflate, it's easier to inflate one lung than the other. <coughs> Interestingly, what also happens is that the respiratory cycle time, or the time that you take to go from the beginning of one breath to the beginning of the next breath, gets shorter when the chest gets stiffer. That's how people start breathing shallower. So if you have a shorter time to breathe in, and you're only going to expand one portion of your chest, that combination is going to lead to the scoliosis becoming more progressive. Because air exerts pressure that influences how bone growth occurs. And so, when we see early onset scoliosis between four to six, five, four to seven years of age, it worries me that this is something that's going to progress very quickly, particularly as children get to eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years of age and go through their secondary growth spurt at puberty. So, um, I struggle with whether or not, and I think it just depends on pathology, whether you know, scoliosis leads to what we call tidal volume changes. That means they breathe shallower. That leads to reductions in lung volume. And finally, you get higher carbon dioxide levels and oxygen levels. Or really, is it the loss of volume that occurs first that leads to the development of um, scoliosis in um, these individuals? I struggle, and I think the answer lies and depends on the pathology, because some individuals come into the spectrum of muscle weakness after an accident, and some people are born into it. So, um, I think Reagan covered some of this when she talked about uh, planning for surgical, um, uh, surgical evaluations. And I think that's a separate topic by itself, but we can maybe discuss in the breakout sessions. I really didn't include that, but Thank you for bringing that up. So what about the sleep study? The sleep study. So this is, um, you know, parents tell me this is a sleepless study because they never sleep. Usually a parent is supposed to accompany the child in the sleep lab. And the way our hospital is designed, the bed for the parent is under the vent, which is always very cold, so they never <coughs> sleep. But the children, despite all of these sticky, leads everywhere are still able to fall asleep. So what it is, is there's some limited EEG attachments. The electrodes are attached to the scalp, so we can assess sleep stages, and we know whether they're in dream sleep or non-dream sleep. Um, we also get chin muscles, we get eyes, so we can pick up rapid eye movement or dream sleep. These are electrodes, that's our computer acquisition rooms. It's fairly standard beds. This pull-out couch is the uncomfortable one for the family. And what I'll show you what we look at it, it looks like. But we also are able to do our titrations where we adjust nasal mask pressures on these children. But anyway, all those electrodes connect to a head box which feed into a computer, and it produces something for us that looks rather graphic. The reason I, I'm not too sure. This is a typical, you know, scenario of what I look at on a daily basis when I'm looking at sleep studies. So just to walk you through it, the, the two line, leads in blue up here show you rapid eye movements. These are the eyes, left eye and the right eye. Odd numbers are the left side, even as the right side. And you can see some rapid eye movements over here. Um, <coughs> the patient is in REM sleep or dream sleep. The rest in black over here is EEG. You've got a chin tone, 
There is leg movements because we look at twitches and movements of sleep. There's a snore channel for some snoring. And this, oh, we have now about 10 different leads that are looking at respiratory measurements, okay? <coughs> so there is air pressure sensors, air flow sensors. There is the carbon dioxide tra tracing that we're looking at. There's looking at intercostal activity, which is the muscles between the ribs. Um, there's chest and belly movements that we are tracking. There's an ECG. Um, these are the numeric values for the carbon dioxide measurements for breathing in and out, as well as across the skin here. And there's the oxygen level over here. And then this tells you the, just the pulse amplitude waveform. So um, this over here is actually an older boy. He's awake. And I took off the EEG just to show you something that even awake, sitting in a chair, he's breathing fast. He's breathing about 30 times a minute. And um, you look at his chest and belly movements, they're out of sync. It's what we call respiratory paradox. But once he's asleep and he's on his support, he's letting the machine do its job, he sleeps like a baby. And you can see the chest and belly movements are in sync, and he's completely dependent on the um, intercostal, I mean on the uh, nasal mask ventilation. So, airway clearance is really another part of, an important part of staying well for these children. So, it is so common for us to see children come in with pieces of equipment that are probably not therapeutically appropriate for them. Understand that children with cystic fibrosis have thick mucus, which is hard to move, and don't clear on their own, and, but they have strong coughs. And those are the individuals that need maneuvers to help mobilize secretions. So they have percussion, they have IPPB, which is intermittent pulse pressure breathing. It's like a vibratory uh, or compression and rarefaction force developed orally. Um, they use the vest, they're taught huff coughs. So all of these maneuvers are good for people who have good strong coughs and need assistance clearing thick secretions. But children with, or adults with neuromuscular disease don't, unless they have cystic fibrosis, have normal mucus like you and I. What causes mucus accumulation is not having enough airflow. If you have to blow your nose, it's airflow that helps clear it. If you have to sniffle, it's airflow that clears it. If you have something in the throat, it's airflow that clears it. So if there's any issue with secretion buildup in the lungs, likely it's because of inadequate airflow or maybe excessive production of mucus if they have a, a pneumonia. Um, so for that, I stress on the fact that everybody needs a lot of water. For every, I tell my patients who drink a lot of Coca-Cola, for every glass you drink, you need three or four glasses of water because it's such a strong diuretic, it will dehydrate you. The <coughs> thick mucus doesn't move, especially when you're weaker. So having a well-hydrated individual is very important, especially if they have a fever where they increase their insensible losses of water. So you definitely want to increase free water. Anytime there's gas, you know, dehydration, you definitely want to for from either from sweating from because it's hot or from diarrhea, you definitely want to increase free water. You don't want these children to dehydrate. It worsens fatigue very quickly. This is the old model of the cough assist and this is the new model of the cough assist and this is a really old bird system. Um, actually, I got this off one of the European um, authored manuscripts. So um, the cough assist is what we use and initially it was used primarily during sickness, but I think over the last eight years, we've been using it pretty much on a daily basis, but in two different modes. So what, I'm, what do I recommend? Yesterday I was asked about airway clearance routines, and so I just threw this together in there. And so when you think about what the cough assist does, it assists a cough. That means, ideally, you should participate with the machine. It's very, it's less productive to do this on an infant or a child who's not cooperative. So the machine delivers a deep inspiration. You take a deep breath with the machine. It allows you to take that huge deep breath. You will feel the tightness in the chest, 
you will feel the diaphragm move down and stretch and I encourage you for those of you who have it or your families have it to definitely try it on yourself um, I deliver an inspiration depending on the age of the child from about two to three seconds rarely have I gone beyond that it's followed by a rapid exhalation from about 0.8 to 1.2 seconds and then there is a pause after that the patient is expected to cough during this time and I want you to think about your own cough you take a deep breath in and then you have a cough which lasts really a split second you don't cough for one or two seconds so I still see people who sometimes use two seconds here two seconds here and two seconds here my concern with that is you're going to pull all the air out of the lung and leave someone very depleted so it's most important also that after you finish a cycle of coughs to end with a positive breath because the last thing the machine did was pull air out and you need to replace that to reinflate the lung so I usually pick a medium flow and then I adjust the pressures for comfort we can talk about pressures later so we say each cycle is about four to five coughs and then we do three to five cycles until the secretions are clear or at least um, it's reasonable enough to give the patient a pause or a break at that time. It's really important to rest between the cycles and sometimes just give them positive breaths so you don't exhaust. But this is pretty exhausting. If you have to do it for five cycles, it is, it's like coughing 25, 30 times. That's not um, energy friendly. So this is a handout that I actually had um, with in my office and delivered to families when we were doing the hyperinflation, and this is before the new coffices came out, uh, where we would dial in the, the time and the pause, and there's no exhalation. So really what this was doing is giving a deep breath and allowing for the exhalation to occur spontaneously by the patient. You can do the same thing with an ambu bag and either a mask or a mouthpiece. So the reason we initiate support, breathing muscle support, is because we know that there is a relief of symptoms in terms of insomnia, feeling well, less fatigued in the day, and more productive. It also reduces the calorie burn. The problem with a lot of these children is because that they have difficulty gaining weight, and it doesn't make sense that you ask them to breathe more and have struggle to gain weight. We can certainly avoid any tracheostomies or intubations unnecessarily and facilitate extubation, which is taking out the breathing tube after surgery. There is enough data to show that there's improvement in quality of life and function status, and clearly this in, in, involves, um, increases in prolonged survival in these patients. So, Reagan mentioned something called BiPAP. I try not to use the word BiPAP because it is um, a patented term by Respironics. I like to use the word bi-level pulse of pressure support. So if this is your normal breath, this is really what I'm trying to explain occurs when they breathe shallower and faster. And so what the machine is trying to do is, it offers two levels of pressure. One, you, um, one pressure actually helps support taking a deeper breath. So it makes this breath progressively bigger until it becomes more normal. And the second is, it helps, it cycles off at this point, and in the background you have a second pressure, and that's why we call it high level positive airway pressure. So one supports breathing in, and then this background pressure supports the process of breathing out so that they don't collapse lung tissue. So why do we, again, why do we get a sleep study? Like I said, we do this in order to prevent weight loss or to assure optimal weight gain when you're dealing with failure to thrive. We're treating clinical symptoms of fatigue, headaches, you know, frequent nighttime awakening, persistent high heart rates. So that's the other compensatory mechanism that takes place because the patient is under stress all the time the heart rate said to be higher. Anything that causes more calorie burn causes difficulty gaining weight. Um, if their carbon dioxide levels while awake is greater than 40 millimeters of mercury when they're breathing fast, that is a cause of concern for me. We have, it has been well established that if you actually treat them with nighttime support, their daytime carbon dioxide levels get better. And if you see something in the blood, it's usually a late sign, so either higher numbers of red blood cells or higher bicarbonate levels, those are rare, um, those are um, late signs. So clearly, you would definitely want to start non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or uh, bi-level pressures 
whenever there is evidence of hyperventilation, that means carbon dioxide levels greater than a certain threshold. When you have no pauses in breathing, which is called apnea, but you still have low oxygen levels, and that comes from breathing shallower. When we see respiratory paradox with low saturations and sometimes without apneas, it's often associated with children waking up frequently through the night. And certainly with any respiratory insufficiency that gets precipitated by an illness, some of these children will be fine. They'll have a normal sleep study, quote unquote, and then come to the hospital sick, and that's when they fall off the edge. And then there are some areas where we can consider it when there are softer signs um, to consider. So um, again, something I wanted to share with you is this is the pre and the post surgery evalu evaluation for one of our um, LAMA2 patients. And you can see the MBC on a patients. And really what is impressive is that because his spine got straighter, on the x-ray, this looks taller. And so, and you can see the same thing occur over here. And so what that translated into is, when he had his surgery, his lung function actually dropped significantly, but he recovered his values, the actual liters, amount of volume he could move, although the percent predicted didn't improve as much. So percent predicted is a complex number, and this is mostly for clinicians that I think the interpretation of pulmonary functions pre and post surgery for our neuroscopic patients is again something that needs to require, that requires a little more heart. Some additional considerations, I always look at the jaw structure because that's important in deciding what kind of nasal mask we would wear or a full face mask. This young man, he cannot close his jaw fully. He's never eaten a piece of pizza. You can see the back teeth are what meet and so um, he has a persistent open bite. And so if we use a nasal mask for him, he will lose pressure out of his mouth. And it will be hard to ventilate him with that. So paying attention to the um, upper airway is also important. And so what we use during the day um, for added support is a um, portable SIP ventilator. It's an on-demand system. It really helps improve the energy levels for these patients. So in summary, I think monitoring of these patients is really important, and it should be serial, like every six to 12 months, getting pulmonary function tests, so it tells you a story over time. You cannot, I don't react to a single pulmonary function test unless someone is looking very sick, but I want to get a story on my patient so I can understand what their trajectory is and what their baseline is. Spinex evaluations should be the norm for all of our young children looking for early onset scoliosis. I recommend, we recommend a sleep study at 12 to 18 months, but if they, get land, if they land up on support, then checking pressures probably every two to three years is not a bad idea because it's a growing child. And certainly the institution of coffices therapy, both for stretching as well as for airway clearance. Thank you.